There is a single word that changed my entire life. The first time I heard it was on a day quite a lot like today. It was sunny in Los Angeles. I wasn't far from here on 29th and Central. In fact, the person that told it to me is in the room. It happened to be Valentine's Day, and as I stepped into a broke down trailer <laughs> for my first day of training as a youth mentor, I had no idea how much I would actually learn. The word is a feeling. The word is something you can give someone. The word is an experience and probably something you have never heard before. The word is salobona. Salobona, it's a Zulu phrase from Africa and it means I see you or we see you, like the whole tribe sees you and recognizes you. They say it takes a village to raise a child and you know, these days, not very often do young people know adults that they don't consider authority figures or somebody they might get in trouble with, like their parents, the police, or uh, teachers at school. In African tribes, they would teach our young people how to be adults through rites of passages, like hunting or maybe cooking. We just don't do that as much anymore. I mean, the only rites of passages are really if somebody has a quinceanera or in Jewish culture, a bar mitzvah. And so many of our young people are initiating themselves through teen pregnancy and gangs. Seeing someone for their gifts is at the root of the mentoring work that I do. Um, but it doesn't, well, so actually, I'm going to teach you something. At mentoring, we start every single session by saying, Salabona. And the response is, Yabo Sabona, which means, I see you seeing me. So let's try it really quick. Salabona. No, 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 you say Yabo Sabona. <laughs> so Salabona is, I see you. And Yabo Sabona is the response, I see you seeing me. So one more time, Salbona. That's perfect. And Salbona isn't exclusively for young people. In fact, uh, the first time I ever really got to travel and I went uh, to South Africa, it was the furthest I'd ever been away from home. I'd never been gone more than a week. And uh, I had never been without cell phone and internet. And at the time, they didn't have it in Africa. And the flight to South Africa was 22 hours. My stomach was in knots the whole way there. I was really anxious, and I got off the plane, and the customs line was a monster. I made my way up to my turn, and I put down my passport, and the man working said, Salabona. <laughs> and I looked at him, jet lagged and confused and startled, and I said, Yabo Sabona? <laughs> and he said, Yabo. And suddenly, I was on the other side of the world in completely familiar territory. And I knew at that moment I was going to have the trip of a lifetime, and I did. Uh, you can Salabona people every single day. Um, just by noticing the person next to you right now. You don't have to say it out loud. It's walking through the streets in your neighborhood and actually saying good morning to your neighbors rather than looking the other way. It's noticing the really beautiful little girl with braided hair and saying, your braids are so pretty. Who braids your hair? Your sister? Oh, who braids your hair? Oh, your Nana. You are so lucky to have a Nana that braids your hair. I wish I did. So, I mean, suddenly she realizes that uh, how special she is. 
a moment of pride and gratitude. You can do that every single day. There's been a few times in my life that Salabona has completely changed my entire life. I'll tell you about it, and um, I want to challenge you to have more Salabona moments as well. The first time I remember I chaperoned a field trip to the Dodgers game with a whole bunch of kids. And I was with these teenage boys, and funny thing about teenage boys, 16-year-old boys can look much older, like 25, intimidating, and be really scary to strangers. Another thing about teenage boys, they go from being really excited to bored fast. And about the third inning of the Dodgers game, the restlessness kicked in. And one boy popped off, and he said, man, I'm bored, and the Dodgers suck. And the negativity and the restlessness started to spread. It was contagious. Another boy started cheering for the other team, and they were kind of one-upping each other. And another boy uh, started booing every single time the Dodgers did something great. And then this kid next to me, this little munchkin, when the Dodgers struck out somebody at home plate, he booed and said, I'm going to come to your house and shoot you. I lost it. <laughs> In that moment, I stood up and I said, if you guys hate the Dodgers so much, why did you even come to the game? Because you're ruining it for everybody. There are families here that save their money to do one cool thing with their family all summer long, and you're ruining it for them. You're ruining it for me. I don't even want to sit by you. Silence. I thought they were going to call me every name in the book, but silence. And then I looked at the little dude next to me, and I said, who are you anyways? How come I never see you around? And he told me that he lived by the center, but he went to a charter school that I'd never heard of. It was a charter school with a 98% graduation rate. And he wanted to be an engineer and was thinking about going to Harvard or Yale. Man, I learned two things that day. One, Parenting 101, it wasn't my job to be those kids' best friend. I needed to stand up because kids want attention. And whether it's good attention or bad attention, they're going to act accordingly to get attention. And if in that moment, not in so many words, I didn't tell him that you're better than how you're acting, I would have never seen his true colors. I wouldn't have known he was smart, ambitious, motivated, and on path to go to college. It was a true Salabona moment. And then through mentoring, I met a man named Tony, who was in the streets, also went by Crow. Tony was a mentor with me, but he also did a lot of work with youth and gangs. In fact, when I met him around 2005, he had just taken a bunch of former gang members to Machu Picchu for a, a different kind of initiation and transformation. I got to attend a lecture where he spoke about it, and man, the work he was doing was so powerful and healing. His energy was larger than life. I was completely inspired. When I first met Tony, it was winter. And he did construction for a living and was working outside all day. So he would come in with these big jackets and scarves and gloves. And it was really crazy because as it got to spring and the layers started coming off and I got to know him, I saw that he was covered head to toe in gang tattoos himself. And then I learned that he had been a heroin addict for about 16 years. He had been in prison for 14 years. He had only been sober for something like eight years and not a free man for very long. And that changed my whole perspective that day because the way I grew up, I learned there's right and wrong. 
There's good and bad. And you know what? There's bad guys in jail. But that was when I discovered, when is it not a bad guy, but bad circumstances? And when is it not a bad person, but a bad decision? And then in about 2007, the economy collapsed. And all the construction in the city stopped. People weren't building houses anymore. Tony lost his job and couldn't find work for him to support his family because he was a felon. And unfortunately, he relapsed and he took his own life. And it just makes me think that in society, how can we find more Sawabona moments to see people truly for their gifts? And if Tony was locked up in there, who else is in there? And how can we find a way to actually Sawabona people who have done time and help them share their gifts? I, I still don't have the answer, but I think about it all the time. And then finally, if you can believe it, I had a crazy Sawabona moment two weeks ago. <laughs> I was in Detroit, and I got to see this unbelievable thing called the Heidelberg Project. It's about two blocks of street art around abandoned bu buildings and houses that have been burnt down and arson, so it's just the bones of the house. This man named Tyree Gutton has turned the entire thing into a magnificent piece of art. I think more than anybody in the world, the people here today in Watts would appreciate it because it really reminded me of the man-made miracle that Simon Rodia did just down the street with the Watts Towers. In fact, most people drive by and look at it and don't get out of their cars because they don't feel safe. We did. <laughs> we parked the car, we walked around. There was a snowstorm happening. It was so eerie. There were only two other people on the streets and they were pushing shopping carts. I thought that they were homeless. I'll be really honest, I double checked to make sure I'd lock the car. And as I walked around and saw the beauty in this chaos, the most unreal art I have ever seen, I mean, there was a chain link fence, fence with thousands of pairs of sneakers on it tied up with the laces. There were clocks hanging from the trees and a wheelbarrow full of mountains of old baseball and soccer trophies stacked sky high. As I was reading more about the Heidelberg Project, I could see one of the men that I thought were homeless in my peripheral. I went out on a limb and I said, is this your art project? And he said, yes. And I said, are you Tyree? And he said, yes I am, who are you? And I introduced myself and we started this conversation and we talked about time, perception, and reality. He quoted Plato, Matisse, and Nelson Mandela. This man had traveled all over the world for 30 years, but always brought his art back home to Detroit. And I asked him, I was curious, if his art had changed with the rise and fall of the Detroit economy. And he said, Every single thing that's wrong with Detroit exists in Los Angeles. And every single thing that's great about Detroit exists in Los Angeles too. Detroit is just a microcosm for the rest of the world. He told me when he was born, his grandmother told him he was gonna be a great man. And he is a great man because he's found his purpose doing art in the city of Detroit. And he said he'd like to ask our president, why is he not great? Make America great again? I look around and I am great. This area is great. What is wrong with you, Mr. President? And in that moment in the snowstorm, I was holding back tears because somehow it felt like the universe had sent me a little art angel, and in the streets of Detroit, I was standing there and I realized I was great too. With Sawabona, you have to truly see somebody. And it's not just the, 
genius and the beauty. You have to see a lot of times past your own judgments and look at people's scars and their wounds to see who they truly are. With out Salabona, the little future engineer on his way to Harvard at the baseball game would have just been another troublemaker. Without Salabona, Tony would have just been another recovering drug addict felon and not somebody that changed my entire life. Without Salabona, Tyree Gutton would have just been another excuse to cross the street in Detroit. And so I challenge you to make Salabona a part of your life every single day. It, now more than ever, we really need to Salabona our neighbors, our coworkers, the people in our neighborhood, because we need those gifts. We need that strength. We need the community to all work together and make a difference. So that's why I came to Watts today, to say Salabona. Okay, you already forgot. <laughs> when I say Salabona, you're supposed to say Yaba Sabona, okay? So one more time, Salabona, Yaba. Thank you so much.